Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 1 now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives and to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon after that Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem by the hand of Elisa the son of Shaphan and Gamariah the son of Hilkiah whom Zedekiah king of Judah sent unto Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon saying thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel unto all that are carried away captives whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. For in peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished that Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and causing you to return to this place. Verse 11, the last scripture. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I, I wanted to preach to you on this subject this morning, life in the rubble, life in the rubble. Can you lay your Bibles down, everyone close your eyes and lift up your hands. Let's ask God to speak. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your people. I thank you for what you, you've done already. Thank you for what you're doing in Giovanni. God, I thank you for what you're doing in all of our families and all of the homes. God show yourself mighty today we feel your prophetic touch help us to obey it help me to obey it to a T God anoint me anoint your people help us to respond to your presence help us to respond to this moment because it's not by might nor by power but by your spirit speak Lord for thy servant hears in Jesus name amen can you clap your hands one more time Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Somebody shout, yes. yes. Life in the rubble. Jeremiah's ministry was so unique because his prophetic ministry, he... God needed him to be something different in his generation. His ministry was not measured by how many souls came into the kingdom. His ministry was not measured by how many people listened to his voice. His ministry was not predicated by the thousands or the hundreds hearing his message or reading his letters. His success in ministry would be predicated by God saying, I just need you to be a voice. And God forewarns him that they're not going to listen to you. But just because they don't listen to you, that doesn't mean you're unsuccessful. I just need you to be a voice that cries out even when no one's listening. Somebody that is just willing to speak what thus saith the Lord, even when it's not popular, even when no one wants to hear it. I just need 
a voice because that voice will be a testament of grace and mercy that I never leave a generation without a voice. And he never prophesied that there would be a famine of the word. He said that there would be a famine of the hearing of the word. And so the word will always be there, but the issue is our people listening to that word. And so Jeremiah is instructed to not internalize the resistance of his culture, but to just keep on prophesying and keep on preaching and don't determine the success of your preaching by the response of the people, but by your obedience to the word of God. And God forewarns Jeremiah that he will be resistant. What a, what, what a call to ministry. He says, I'm calling you in a ministry. And by the way, they ain't listening to you. He's like, well, why do you want me to speak then? He's like, I just need you to be a voice. I, I, I just need you to be a voice to let them know that I'm always giving grace and mercy even when they don't want to receive anything I want to say. He said, they're going to resist you. They're going to oppose you. But this is what I want you to understand. Before the rubble hits your life, Jeremiah, before they cast you in prison, before they hurt you, before they have you cry so much, Jeremiah, that they refer to you as the weeping prophet. Before you ever shed a tear, Jeremiah, I want to share with you something. Before you ever write a whole book called Lamentations, uh, crying and complaining to the Lord, Jeremiah, I want you to understand one thing. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And what I want you to understand is before the rubble or resistance ever hits your life, you have to understand that you have been created by me and you have to understand that I, my hand was upon you before the rubble ever hit. And to survive the rubble of life that Jeremiah would have for the next 40 years of ministry. God wanted him to understand that his assignment did not come from earth and did not come from culture. But it came from the throne of heaven. And that God had ordained his life to, to root out, to tear down, to build up and to plant. And that it's not going to be an easy life, but it's going to be a God-led life. Come on, somebody. See, see, sometimes our humanity wants to always choose the path of least resistance, even if it leads us nowhere. Someone said it this way, I'm, I'd rather be on the rough road going somewhere than to be on the clear road going nowhere. I'd rather be on the rocky road that leads me to destiny than to be on a paved road that leads me into aimlessness, not accomplishing what God put me here to do. And so in order for Jeremiah to survive the rubble, God lets him know from the beginning, you have to understand, my calling upon your life, it didn't start in time, it started in eternity. And you live for the affirmation of one and the audience of one. You don't live to please anybody around you, you live to please me. You have to understand, before the rubble and the chaos ever hits, it doesn't change my hand on you or my pleasure in you. This is how you survive the rubble of life. You have to understand before you were formed in the belly that God already knew you uh, that his can was already on you before you ever got here and God had faith in you long before you had faith in him L long before you knew who he was he knew you, who you were and God has been working behind the scenes, fashioning your life, setting things up to bring you into moments of, of an encounter with him that will transform your life. So you can have strength from the heavenlies while you're dealing with the rubble, the chaos, the, the devastation, and the waste of life. He said, 
what I want you to understand is that before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you and I ordained you as a prophet unto the nations. And Jeremiah said, oh Lord God, I cannot speak, I'm, for, I'm but a child. But the Lord said unto me, say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee to speak, I want you to speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver you, saith the Lord. What you have to understand is that in order for you to survive the rubble of life, you have to go to the God that existed before the rubble. You have to understand that your life is pinpointed, that you don't measure your success or your, or, or, or your advancement by what's going on around you. Don't look around you for direction. Look up. And when you look up, you'll get direction. And if you fall, come on, it says that a just man falls seven times and it rises again. A righteous man falls seven times and he rises again. And rejoice not against me, O oh mine enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise. And though I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. In life, you're going to fall sometimes. He said, when I fall. But he said, but when you fall, at least fall on your back so you're always looking up. Come on, somebody. Don't fall face down. If you fall, fall flat on your back so you can look up and see the light of heaven. So you can look up and see the Son of God. So you can look up and see hope. At life, there's going to be failures, there's going to be ups and downs, but when you fall, I'm just asking for you to not fall face down, fall face up. He said, though I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light in me. I'm on my back, but I'm looking up to the light. I'm on my back, but in the darkness, I'm looking up to the stars. I'm on my back, but I'm looking up to the potential of what could be. And no, I'm on my back, and it doesn't feel good right now. But rejoice not against me, oh mine enemy, because there's something pulling on me from heaven. It says, I'm going to arise, that I am not defined by what I'm going through right now, but I'm defined by a pull from heaven. I'm defined by a pool from another world. The things that keep me in the rubble are things that are not in time. A nice home can't keep you happy. A nice vehicle can't keep you happy. A lot of good stuff can't keep you happy. No, you have to live for something beyond time. You have to tap into a God that existed before you got all that stuff. When the God that just that loved you when you had nothing. Come on, somebody. God that cared about you when you didn't have anything to offer. That's what you got to go to. The, the heavenly father that, that loved you while you was complaining. Right? The heavenly father that loved you while he was changing your diapers come on somebody you know some people they grow up and they get so successful that they forget that they had diapers God will keep you humble y'all come on somebody don't ever forget there was a moment that you were dependent on somebody else to survive and that's why he said that the kingdom is like becoming a child. It's never forgetting that there is a dependency on more than me. I'm not trying to be so independent that I don't need God. I've got to rely and depend on him. And that's where my strength comes from. So God prepares him. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. You have to hold on to that because life is going to get rough. But you got to hold on to that. I called you before you ever hit the rubble. And when God calls you or gives a promise to you, he doesn't give it to you from the standpoint of time. He gives it to you from eternity. Oh, the promises of God are in him, yea and amen. The, your promise is sealed in God. Therefore, time cannot touch it. Y'all going to throw me out of here. If, if my promise is in his eternal bosom and in him, 
Time cannot nullify what God has spoken. It has no authority. Because I didn't get it from time, I get, got it from heaven. Hell can't take it away from me. Because for hell to try to take away my promise, that means that he would have to attack God to get it. And he beheld Satan fall as lightning. When hell thought of attacking God, he went, he went down. Just, just iniquity was found in his heart. He started thinking, and as soon as he started thinking, God said, well, boy, get out of here. <laughs> hell can't touch it. Hell can't take it. And so when, whenever I'm discouraged by the rubble, I've got to put my mind back into eternity. And when he gives me the promise, he, he considers... God's in eternity, we're in time. Time is like a little speck. Eternity is vast. Here it is. So God's in eternity and he visits time to give me a promise. But he gives me the promise, here it is, within the context of the end of my life, not the beginning of my life. He doesn't give it to me from the beginning because that means time has authority over it. He gives me a promise within the context of my entire life. So he sees the rubble before he gives the promise. Are you getting it? See, the rubble surprises you, but it doesn't surprise God because he factors the rubble into the promise. And he would have never gave you the promise if he didn't already consider the promise's power over the rubble of life. He gives it to you, factoring it in. He factors your mistakes in. He factors the, the failed relationships in. He factors the stumbling blocks in. When he gives it to you, he does it from the end of your life. That's how he works. He goes from, see, see because he's in eternity. So, so he sees the beginning of history and the end of history from eternity. And he's just watching. And every now and again, he'll just come visit. Let me help you here. Uh, don't do that. Let me help you here. He's not bound by time like we are. Amen. And so, and so he does it from the, the, the end of your life, not the beginning. And that's why the first language of God is Hebrew because Hebrew is backwards. If you want to read a Hebrew book, you got to go to the back of the book. You got to go to the back of the book to begin. See, God... Went to the back of your life. Are you getting it? He gives you a promise from the end of your life. And from the ending, he's working and trying to steer you. And... Okay. Y'all going to throw me out of here this morning. I, I, I came to preach to somebody. And, and so, I, 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 in my in time, I was called to preach at 19 years old. But from the eternal perspective, come on somebody, God put me on this earth to preach. I told you uh, and how for the first five years of my life, I could not speak a word of English intelligibly for the first five years because of the trauma and getting beaten and the broken ribs and the busted lips for the first 11 years of my life. But the first five years, I couldn't speak. I went to a speech therapist for a year in, in kindergarten to teach me how to talk. But before I went to that speech therapist, the only thing that they understood that I said, the only thing they understood that I said was me on my grandma's porch, picking a stick up off the ground at three years old, swaying side to side, and the only word they understood that I said was Jesus, 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 acting like I was preaching. I wasn't raised in church. Come on, somebody. I was raised in the rubble. But I'm so thankful I had a God that was willing to work in me even while I was in the... Come on, somebody. And if God did that for Victor Jackson, what has God been doing for you? He was working for you long before the hell ever came into your life and world. So, 
so I had the calling to preach I just didn't know it yet why because the promise is locked up in him and in order for me to discover my identity I can't discover it in my education I can't discover it in my present relationships I can only discover it in him that's the trick about God the only way for me to get joy is I can't get it from anywhere in time I gotta go to his presence I gotta step into eternity and I gotta get something that only comes from God I can't get peace by my workplace come on somebody I can only get peace from his presence and in his presence there is fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore if you want joy you gotta get into his presence if you want peace you gotta get into his presence so so, so i he knew me before i knew him so in order for me to unlock my destiny i could only do it in relationship with him see there's things that's locked up in your life that cannot be unlocked until you enter into his presence that's why we clap and shout and dance why because he inhabits the praises of his people that's why we praise that's why we pray prayer is just communication between between me and God and, and prayer in that communication me and his relationship grows and he starts revealing things in me that I didn't know was there while well, I thought I was on earth to play basketball as I started this journey in relationship I started receiving signals from the heavenlies I said I didn't put you on earth to just play basketball I put you on earth to preach my gospel to the world I got a heavenly signal in the rubble I got a signal in the rubble so to survive the rubble I had to get more into his presence and I knew I couldn't do it just by see some of y'all are, are, are so amazingly you, you, you're, you're a genius but the problem where that mind gets in trouble is because the mind can only understand just human minds and human things and things in time and, and systems of the world but he said the spirit of man can only understand the things of the spirit of man and so the spirit of God knows no man save the spirit of God the only way meet for me to understand spiritual things is I've got to have the spirit of God working in me so I can have a signal of what's happening and he said when you get the spirit you will understand those things that are freely given to you meaning there's things in his presence I don't even have to work for there's things in his presence I don't even have to yearn for there's things that he just freely gives to me why because it's something eternal that eclipses my time in the rubble so life in the rubble the way we exist with the peace is to understand things from God's perspective Whew. and that he didn't promise us a crystal stare he didn't promise us this amazing, never have trouble life. That's where people get disappointed in God. They're like, hold on, man, I got saved. What's all this happening? I don't know who voice that was. I just, I just made that up on the spot, ain't I? What's all this happening? What's all this? And they start questioning the validity of their relationship with God. But you have to get what Paul got. Where Paul said, I I've learned to abound and I've learned to abase. He said, he said that I've learned in every state I'm in to be content. And the ups and the downs, I've learned to be content. And he said, what's helping me be content in the ups and downs, he says it this way, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. See, he's not talking about all things, you know, we, we put that on everything now, you know, we put, we put that on everything. I mean, you have, you know, uh, you know, a criminal puts on his thing, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens <laughs> me. 
But what Paul's talking about is I can do all things. I can abound and abase and be happy on the mountain and in the valley because Christ is strengthening me. He is my source of contentment. And there's something about God is that God is stable. My goodness, that's something to thank God for. God is consistent. You, you, you ever had friends that if, 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 you, get, if, if you get, you know, uh, super blessed, they don't talk to you no more? <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh my God, I'm scared to be blessed. I lose friends. Somebody wave a hand. You see, y'all going to act crazy this morning. See? Or in trouble. Y'all have all these friends, but when you're in trouble, it's like crickets. It's just like, my God, I don't ever want to tell people I'm in trouble because I always lose friends when I'm in trouble. See, the relationships in time, they ebb and flow. So you've got to build your life in something consistent. That in, in the, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is consistent. He loves me when I'm up. He loves me when I'm down. He loves me when uh, you walk into the office and, 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 and you're bold and, and he loves you when you can't get out of bed with two tubs of ice cream next to you. I'm not trying to, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to uh, be in discernment, okay? I'm just, if you have two tubs of ice cream next to you, I'm not calling you out, amen? I'm just, I'm just talking, amen? I'm just, random example. Ran, who told pastor I got that? <laughs> Bluebell vanilla. <laughs> you don't do the tub because you feel guilty. You do the pint size. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Amen. And the consistency is, guess what? God loves you the same. When you can't get out of bed and when you can't wait to get out of bed, he's consistent. You got to build your life over that. That's the only way you survive the rubble. And in Jeremiah's time, he is prophesying about they, they were going to be captive by the Babylonians because of their disobedience to God's word. Listen to this. This is profound to me. And so he's telling them, listen, y'all better get your act together or we going in bondage. And then all these false prophets were saying, it ain't happening it ain't happening. And so Jeremiah became the one person that was telling the truth. And they're like, put this guy in jail. Because he prophesied something we don't like. Put, like, like throw him away. Like, he, he crazy. Like, here comes Jeremiah. La, 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 la. Don't want to hear Jeremy. But everybody else prophesying, no, it ain't happening. I'm telling you, we're going to beat the Babylonians. And Jeremiah's like, come on, guys. Y'all really can do this? Well, guess what? The Babylonians came knocking on the door. And they were bringing them to Babylon in stages. And finally, the last residue of the people, Jeremiah writes a letter. And he says, because what they were prophesying at this time was, now listen, you know how when like some people that, you know, uh, profess themselves to be spiritual, like they try to prophesy something and it don't happen. And so they kind of adapt their prophecy. Like, oh, no, I didn't mean it like that. No, I meant like, like hey, you, this is going to happen in your business tomorrow. And then like your business, like you lose your job. And then you come to them like, hey, bro, you prophesied that I was going to be, my, my, my business was going to be blessed. And then they come and say, oh, no, no, it was like a different type of blessing. And this is like one of those, like, this is the blessing nobody wants. And you're looking at them like, <laughs> and they're like, yeah, this is like one of them John the Baptist blessings, like in prison type blessing. Like, hold on, your prophecy keep moving. That's what those prophets were doing in Jeremiah's time because they said, we ain't getting captive by the Babylonians. I'm telling y'all. They get captive. And then the prophets are saying, oh, listen, you, you, know, you, you know when somebody just lied to you and they say, listen. 
<laughs> and you're like, I'm listening, but you still lying. <laughs> Listen, I, I didn't mean it like that. You see, the Babylonians came, right? Uh, uh, uh-huh. Yeah. Um, we're just going to be here for a little bit. We're just going to be here for a little bit. I know I said they wasn't going to come, but it's different now. <laughs> the Babylonians are strong. They overwhelm in prophecy. It's like, the, it's like the thing they put on uh, one, one place. They said, hey, uh, prophecy conference scheduled due to unforeseen events. <laughs> Y'all can laugh. It's okay to laugh, everybody. It's, uh, we're good. Everything's good. They said, no, okay, Babylonians came, but, but let me tell you something. They, they, they just, we're just only going to be here a little while. This is just a little rubble. There's a little, they, they were literally watching the temple being burned down. And then prophets like, <laughs> like how am I going to get out of this one? Amen. Just like, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, how you, and Jeremiah's right, but they don't, you know how somebody's right, but they don't want to say that they're right, so they rather, you know how someone sticks with the lie so long, they don't, even when they're proven wrong, like they, they got to hold on to the lie. Like, you like, I got evidence, you lying. You're like, that, they're like, that ain't me. And this is a video of you lying. He's like, nah, man, that's one of them AI things, bro. That's one of them. That's one of them. <laughs> Can you believe they're using my face? They're using my face. <laughs> they stuck with the lies so much. They said, yeah, they, the Babylonians came, but let me tell you something. We're we going to be out of here soon, y'all. And they prophesying falsely. We're going to be out of here soon. We're going to be out of here soon. Jeremiah says, hold on, let me tell you what, what's happening. Thus saith the Lord. Look what he says. In the rubble, build ye houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that ye may be increased there and not diminished. That yes, the rubble has come. The temple is in ashes. Nothing in life went according to the plan that you wanted it to go. But he said, here's what I need you to do. You're going to be in Babylon in captivity in this situation for 70 years. So stop trying to find a quick way out of it. You're going to be here for a little bit. But just because you're in this rubble doesn't mean you can't be productive. Oh my. I'm going to help somebody here. Because there are people that are listening to me right now that have been in a situation for a while and you keep trying to find quick fixes. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get this personal development book. You read it. You try to enact it. God looking at you like. Because if I'm not turning the situation around, I'm turning you around. Come on. I am using the rubble to perfect something in you. I'm using the rubble to, to force you into conforming to me. And I'm using the rubble of, of rocks, the wasted rocks, to lead you to the rock. That is higher than you. As David said, when I'm old, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. I I'm using the rubble. See, when, when the rubble hits, the rubble is just a pile of rocks. It's just a pile of wasted rocks, a pile of fragmented rocks or debris. And when you're in rubble, you start, 
You're surrounded by all of this. And you know what? Because you're such a, a fixer, you say, like, I can, oh, my. Let's put these rocks together. Oh, oh that's more rocks? Oh, man. All right, let, let's all put, oh, that, oh, that's more rocks? How, how many rocks have we got? Uh, about about, about 10, 10 million? Then you start saying, hold on. I can't fix this by myself. I got to lean on something higher than me. I got to go to something greater than me. I've got to go to something stronger than me. And so while I'm in this rubble, God says, start building houses. Meaning while you're in captivity, don't sit back and say, y'all, we in captivity, y'all. I would do something, but you know, we in captivity. He said, while you're in the rubble, first point number one is start building from the rubble. Build structure. See, in chaos, start building some structure. That's where you start getting some discipline. You may have lost your job, but you got to get up at 8 o'clock and just start working on something. You may have lost your job, but you got to start building. Your schedule was 9 to 5. Guess what you do? You still wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning. You start working on something at 9. You start working on a dream. You start working on starting a business. You start working on something at 9. You get in your prayer. You get in your Bible. And you got, you got, you got your Bible reading at 9 now. And you got your, your, you got your prayer at 1030 now. And, and you got your worship at, at 11 now. And then you got, you got this, this gift that you're going to work on. And you got this thing you're going to work on. And then you get off at five. I'm in the rubble, but I'm building something. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a structure in the chaos. You see, God allows this, this rubble in our lives to see if we are going to reflect his image. Because here's why. Because God loves bringing order and structure in the rubble. There's nothing that attracts God's hand like chaos. What a time to be conformed into his image that in the, in the chaos, you start building a structure. Like you got rubble all around you. You're like, okay, um, we're going we gonna to do something with this. We're going to do something with this. And then it's like, hold on, y'all. We don't even have a temple no more. Where are we going to pray? And that's where they say, you know what? Let's make some synagogues. That's where the concept of the synagogue came in, a place of study, a place of, a place of uh, to, to, to sing together, to come together and, and read the word and memorize the word. It's through Ezra while they're in captivity. They got the idea to start doing synagogues because they didn't have a temple to worship in anymore. And those synagogues are still around to this day because of what happened under captivity in Babylon. While you're in the rubble, stop trying to look for quick fixes out of it. Start building the structure, number one. And number two, you got to start planting something. You got to start planting. You got to start planting vineyards. You've got to start, here it is, producing fruit. You got to start producing fruit with, with what you're doing for the Lord, with, with your works for the Lord, number one. But number two, the fruit of the Spirit. is nothing like the rubble to encourage patience. And, and how many of y'all know that's not y'all's strong suit? Come on, somebody. It's only the rubble that it does that. We, we, ain't even, we, 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 we even have a popular thing that says, don't pray for patience. A fruit of the Spirit. We say, listen, whatever you do, don't pray for that fruit of the Spirit. Patience. Patience can hurt somebody. People are scared of the fruit of the Spirit. They'll be like, give me love. Give me meekness. Give me joy. Give me temperance. Patience. Hallelujah.
just go silent. Somebody praying that, yeah, pay, patience. Look at you. <laughs> I don't receive, I ain't receiving that in my life. I ain't. <laughs> right? Tribulation worketh patience. Right? And so, and so there's something about it that, that starts developing you into the image of God where you start producing the fruit of the Spirit. You start loving. It's amazing how the rubble starts eliminating the, the edginess of our personality. Like before the rubble, man, we used to be strong with everybody. Just strong about everything. I said decaf! I said Six pieces of ice, you put seven. It's the second time you've done this. You want to know somebody spiritual? You know, you got to. I be seeing people. I study at Starbucks. We were talking about Starbucks. I see people at Starbucks, man. Ooh, bro. Listen, they serious up in there. They serious. Look, look, after they do that order, look, they start waiting like this. Look, look, look. <laughs> they serious up in there. It's like, it's like, look, look, look. Is that mine? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I saw you put cream in. I asked for no cream. Okay, that's not. Oh. <laughs> Isn't it? Wave a hand if you've ever seen somebody like that. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Start pacing back and forth like, like marching orders. Just ready to just catch a case. Just ready to blow up on, blow up on anybody. But then after the rubble, I'm going to say this. this. This wasn't meant to be a convicting point. I was, this, was, this was just, this is hyperbole. People, people, hey. There's conviction on that point. Like, next time you're in Starbucks, look at you. You look. You, you, you. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, Dunkin' Donuts, they don't care how you stand. You're going to be waiting. <laughs> if you want patience, you go to Dunkin' Donuts. They're going <laughs> to they're get your order wrong five times. Just. Somebody just clap your hands to the Lord so I can just move. <laughs> it's because Duncan was made in the rubble. <laughs> Starbucks, you know, they, 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 they were in a good environment when they were made. They were, Duncan, Duncan came from the throws. They just came from the bottom. Went to Dunkin' one time. <laughs> y'all, y'all okay? Y'all <laughs> went into Dunkin' one time because Dunkin' was closer to my house at the time. I said, you know what? I always study at Starbucks. You know what? I'm gonna give Dunkin' a chance because it's not far. I went to go study at Dunkin'. I got all my stuff together, got my planner, got my Bible out, went go order a regular coffee. Mm, my goodness. Fifteen minutes later, I was the only one in the lobby. Fifteen minutes later, they brought me my coffee. And, you know, I'm chill. You know, I'm a laid back person. I was like, okay, thank you. You know, thank you for the coffee. I'm going to be here a while anywhere, anyway because, you know, I, I'm, I'm studying. They give me my coffee. I go sit down. As soon as I go sit down, they come up to me. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. They say, hey, uh, we close in the lobby. I said, what, y'all still open? Yeah, the driveway, we could still be open, but we're closing the lobby. I said, it's four in the afternoon? Yeah, yeah, but it's so busy in the drive-thru that we don't have time for anybody in the lobby. <laughs> look, look, you know what I, look. look. Y'all ain't going to see me back over here. I'm the, the rubble 
creates patience. It creates, it creates temperance. It creates fruit. While you're in the rubble, you have to learn to still produce fruit. The rubble isn't an excuse for flesh. The rubble isn't an excuse for to be carnal. It isn't an excuse to, 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 to lash out at people. Now I hope I didn't offend anybody by talking about Dunkin' Donuts. I thought I love I love it. I still do it. I had one this morning. Amen. Progress. <laughs> I believe in unconditional love <laughs> and reconciliation. While you're in the rubble, build structure, produce fruit, and think about your legacy. Think about your lineage. He said, take wives. Get married. Have children. Think about how this next generation is going to remember how you handled the rubble. And when you build, and when you plant, and when you in, uh, bear children. When you, when you produce, when you think about legacy and lineage, he said, you're going to be increased right there. Just because you're in trouble doesn't mean you can't grow. Just because you're in trouble doesn't mean you can't be increased. See, some people wait till the trouble's over. They're like, okay, man, now I can grow. Now I can thrive. Now, now I can do something great. But you have to learn to increase right in the middle of adversity. While surrounded by attack, surrounded by hell, surrounded by life, in the middle of it, I am choosing to increase right there in the middle of my dilemma. So why did he tell them to keep having children? right there. Because when you go to Matthew 1 and they mention Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, all these lineage of kings, they start listing the children that were born in Babylon. They start listing the children that were going into captivity. Because as long as they kept producing, thinking about lineage, it would eventually lead to Christ. But they say, you know what, we ain't even going to get married no more. It's all hopeless. It's all this. It's all that. It's all this. It's all that. It doesn't give an opportunity for the Messiah to come through their loins. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord thoughts of peace and not evil and to give you an expected end. The captivity won't last forever. The trouble won't last forever. The rubble won't last forever. It will not last forever. It's going to be over and when it's over you're going to come out increased. You're going to come out better. You're going to come out more resilient. You're going to come out with more power. You're going to come out with more. <laughs> Musicians can come. Everyone stand with me. Everyone stand with me. It's amazing that in the Old and New Testaments, there's one principle that you need to take out and that you need to apply to your life today. Here it is. Every time there was adversity, every single time there was adversity, one thing was for sure the people of God grew. When they were in Egypt in captivity as slaves, the Bible says that they afflicted them. 
And the Bible says that the more that they afflicted the children of Israel, the more they multiplied. In Babylon, in captivity, in the rubble, they're still multiplying. Then you go to the New Testament, and the Bible says that they persecuted the disciples. And the more they persecuted them, the more the word was spread abroad everywhere. And the more, the worse things got in their life, the more they increased. And it says that after they persecuted them, that the word of God increased. We're in trouble. Don't stop speaking the word. Speak it even more. Prophesy even more. Speak it. Speak the word of God over your life even more. Declare things over your life even more. That's not the time to be silent. It's the time to start speaking and let the word of God increase even more. But the reality of life is, is that there's always going to be some situations where you, you're left with years of investment in something and you're left in the rubble of it. And that's not the time to quit. That's not the time to give up, throw in the towel. No matter how long the pain lasts, no matter how long the grieving lasts over the loss, one thing's for sure, I'm going to still build. I'm going to build, I'm going to have structure, I'm going to produce fruit, and I'm going to live my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to live my life considering my lineage. When, my, when your kids see mama's tears, see your tears, what's the matter, mama? And all you got to say is, don't worry, mom, mama's just building right now. Daddy, why, why are you so down today? Don't worry, Daddy. Daddy's just producing fruit today. Because it is ensuring that the next generation sees a family that knows how to survive adversity, not from their own strength, but from the strength that only comes from God. Then let me tell you something about Mama. Mama didn't just talk about it. I saw Mama live it out. Daddy didn't just talk about it. I saw daddy live it out. I, I saw what daddy did when he lost his job. The first th thing that he did is he went to church. He went up to the front. He got on his hands and knees. He lifted up his hands uh, and said, God, I need your help. I can't do this. Uh, and the next generation says, that's what I want to follow. Uh, I want to follow somebody uh, that's not shaken by the rubble, uh, that knows how to build structure, uh, that knows how to find a prayer closet, uh, that knows how to get out the book again and knows how to worship in the midst of suffering and can say though he slay me yet Job lost everything and he sat down in the rubble couldn't even stand up in it anymore sat down in the rubble lost his kids lost his ten children marriage is doing bad they disagree and while he's sitting there in the rubble and these friends and they come and accuse him of all of this and he's just sitting down in the rubble. And it's in the rubble we discover poetry. That's what the book of Job is. It's, it's what they call the genre poetry. Oh God. There's a poetry that could come out of the rubble. Beautiful words that came out of a heart of pain but how he manages his rubble he leaves his heart open just enough for God to come in and start speaking and pricking his heart and as God pricks his heart all of a sudden he prays for his friends and God's given them twice as much as he had before and his children now he gets more children how he handled his rubble determined if he can handle more. He got more increase. Because he didn't just survive the rubble. His legacy and his name lived on. How are you going to be remembered? 
I know how you're going to be remembered. You're going to be remembered as a person that didn't quit when life was falling apart. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost talking. I'm talking to somebody. You're going to be remembered as a person that didn't give up, that didn't throw in the towel, that didn't turn their back on God. And even when they wanted to run from him, here you are. You found yourself in the rubble, lifting up those hands to God. In the rubble, you found yourself open the word of God again. In the rubble, you found yourself in a prayer closet again. I'm building my life even in the rubble. I feel his presence. Can you just lift up your hands where you are? Right there in the rubble. Right there in the rubble. Right where you're standing. In the rubble. God, I will praise you in the rubble. God, I, I, I will praise you in the rubble. I'm building something. I'm producing something. And God, I'm not living my life just for me. I'm living my life for my family. I'm living my life so my child could see. This is how you get through adversity. I'm living my life for the next generation huh, to be an example to them on how to hold on to God when everything's falling apart. Huh, and they're going to see me as an example of somebody huh, that didn't give up, huh, somebody that didn't quit, somebody that just didn't lay down in the rubble, huh, but somebody that started planting again, huh, looking for farmer's tools, huh, looking for a hammer, looking for a nail, huh, somebody that's willing to build, huh, somebody that's willing to produce, somebody huh, that never stopped thinking about the lineage it says hold on I gotta build this house cause my daughter's gonna dwell in it one day I'm gonna build this house of hope cause one day my son's gonna dwell in it I'm gonna build this house of praise because one day my child's gonna dwell in it I'm gonna build this house of prayer cause one day the next generation's gonna dwell in it and I'm gonna keep on building I'm gonna keep on building I'm gonna keep on producing I'm gonna keep on loving when I have every reason to hate, I'm going to keep on loving. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, from the front to the back, I want you to step out of your seat. We're going to have a time of prayer before we dismiss. But you need to step out and make a declaration to God. I'm going to keep on building. I'm going to build my life not around these temporal things. I'm going to build my life around your presence. I'm going to build my life around the eternal. I'm going to build my life around the things that are eternal, not the things that are temporal. And the things that are not seen are eternal. And the things which are seen are temporal. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. That's it. That's it. Come find a place to pray. That's it. There's room up here. I feel his presence. I feel the love of God. I feel God moving. That's it. Just lift up your hands as you come forward. And just give your heart to God right now. Make a decision. God, I'm going to build my life upon you. I'm going to build my life upon your principles. I'm going to build my life upon you.